and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 166. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And welcome to this week's show. Now, uh, this week is actually a pretty big week for us because, uh, here in the UK at least, this weekend, clocks go forward. And that means summertime is here. Now, summer's all, it's a lovely time of year, but a very busy one for us normally. Yeah, and you kind of don't notice it nowadays because all your chop clocks automatically change, don't they? When you had to wind them before, (laughs) yeah. One in my car and the oven, I think they're the only two in the house. (laughs) But summer's really crazy for us because we're doing all the gaming events, so this is going to be a fantastic one, and the first one's going to be Play Expo in Manchester. Yeah, this is going to be a massive one as well. I mean, the thing about it is, I mean, there's lots of gaming shows in the UK, but this one is so focused on retro, and we go to the mall and we do our own stage at Play Expo. So, essentially, if you love this podcast and you want to see us do it live... And we're joined by legends on stage. And we have a lot of other people helping us out. Paul Drury from Retro Gamer Magazine is going to be there. And he's going to be doing the talk with Matthew Smith. Oh, yeah. So when I was a kid, we actually did an event called Screenplay in Nottingham. And that was one of the first time Matthew Smith kind of came out of obscurity because he'd, he'd, he'd gone missing for a while. There was even a website, where is yeah. Matthew Smith? <laughs> and uh, now he's basically coming back and he's going to do a wonderful talk with Paul on the stage and we're going to try and get that on the show as well. Yeah, Which absolutely. Great. So if you want to come along, we're going to be there. I mean, essentially walking to Play Expo, it is all your childhood dreams in one place. The guys who made your favourite games, trading areas, machines that you can play on. So if you want to get tickets for it, it's going to be happening in Manchester, right in the heart of Manchester, a great new exhibition place that we've got and you can book tickets through our website at theretrohour.com, happening on the weekend of the 4th and 5th of May. Yeah, it's got all so manic leading up to it as well. But at the end of the weekend, we just collapse, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> but it's so much fun. Now, before we get into this week's show, we've got some really good stuff that we're going to talk about. I love this prototype ZX Spectrum. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. There's some really exciting news this week, and they've finally done it. They've finally made a Mega Drive that's decent. Fine, at long last. How yeah. long have we been crying out for one of those? So if you want to find out all of this week's news stories, of course, we'll talk about them in just a minute, and we link them up on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, the reason that we can come in and keep you up to speed on what's happening in the world of retro every week and bring you amazing guests. We need to talk about this week's guests in just a minute. But it's thanks to you. Now, this show, okay, we do have sponsors on the show quite regularly, but really the main way that we are supported is thanks to listener donations. That is the one thing that keeps us, you know, regularly funded. We can afford to come and do this podcast, all our hosting services, everything's paid for. You know, it means Ravi and I don't have to pay for it all out of our own pocket. So it, honestly, it makes such a difference. And for making a donation of any amount, it all goes back into the pot and keeps this podcast going. You will find your place in the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And you'll get a mention on a future episode, just like this week, John Matanara. Stuart Brand. Matt Hill. And John Piper. Who all find their place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And you can do the same by heading onto our website at theretrohour.com. Now, what a guess we've got this week. Yeah, we've got a fantastic guest this week. And we kind of had John Robertson on last week, who was in Video Game Nation. Well, we've got one of his colleagues, and that's Steve McNeil. Now, Steve McNeil went on after Video Game Nation to... Edinburgh Festival, where he got a lot of comedians drunk on stage and they all played video games. The best way to play games. Yeah, and then <laughs> that somehow ended up on television yeah. and became Go 8-Bit. So we're going to talk all about that. Steve's got a podcast as well. He's got a book coming out, loads of interesting stuff in this. He even did lectures for the uh, Royal Institute, Christmas lectures. Yeah, what? which is crazy, isn't it? I mean, Go 8-Bit was a show, it ran for three series um, here in the UK. On Dave. Yeah, that on was... Dave it was, yeah. And it was... I mean, it was a show that kind of, it wasn't just 8-bit games. I mean, there's a bit of a pun in the name. But there was a lot of retro gaming in there as well. And it was really... It was a panel show, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it was a panel show with video games featured in it. And the thing about it is, I mean, you don't really get, especially retro games, very much on mainstream TV anymore. No, totally. And it's, it's, it's kind of like they're celebrities that mention them. Yeah. So as Steve says, you know, Jonathan Ross is a big fan. Dara O'Brien, um... Ian Lee is, isn't he? Yeah. Ian Lee. Charlie uh, Brooker. Uh, Charlie Brooker, yeah. yeah they're, they're all out there, but yeah. he, he just managed to get them together. All these closet geeks got them all together on stage. So I know a lot of our audience will have loved Go 8-Bit, and uh, you know it's good to get the inside story. Steve McNeil is going to be our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now let's take a moment to give a big up to a really good supporter of the Retro Hour podcast. 
you know, we, we're big fans of The Economist anyway. It's always such a good read as well. And they've really supported this show um, for a couple of months now as well. You know, we really appreciate The Economist's support. And actually, we've got a little offer for you as well, because if you'd like to get a free print copy of The Economist, we'd love you to take up this offer. Now, the thing about The Economist is, I mean, from the title, it's been going a hell of a long time, over 170 years so very well established. And these days, I mean, you know, like anything, it kind of changes with time. It's not just about the economy and finance anymore. It covers stuff like technology, science, arts, video games as well. I was reading this really interesting article they did about this guy um, from Princeton University. And he was doing kind of the artificial intelligence behind self-driving cars. Okay, yeah. And you think how much work has to go into that. Cause, I mean, that is like literally life or death. Yeah, isn't and, the, it? and the calculations and the angles and just the different kind of things that can happen. Especially teaching the car when to stop at stop signs and that kind of thing. So to teach a computer, you've got to think, I mean, he needs, he needs to teach it what old signs look like, new ones, clean ones, dirty ones, ones that might be covered by lorries or buildings or the, the shade on them. And you think if you want to do that through photo libraries or going out and doing it yourself, it's a lot of work. Turns out he actually used Grand Theft Auto V <laughs> to okay. teach the self-driving cars. <laughs> and it's an article all about it in The Economist. I what, was... what was he using then, AI or something? Yeah, to teach the AI. He was actually, this game was like playing Grand oh, Theft Auto V. that's interesting because yeah, uh, we covered uh, DeepMind, which was using uh, Atari 2600 games yeah. to actually train itself. And they had no manuals, no instructions, and the machine actually uh, created an algorithm which was much better than human players. Yeah, it's Google's supercomputer, isn't it? Deep yeah, mind. yeah, DeepMind. Yeah. It's crazy how video games can train AI, though, because you think, I mean, a lot of it, you know, hand-to-eye coordination and problem-solving, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, you think back to, like, war games when it played tic-tac-toe on the screen yeah. and stuff, you know. It's been a, been a big part of AI for a long time, so that's the kind of thing you can read about in The Economist, and they teach you what's going on in the world around you, and, you know, in this day and age, facts matter more than ever. So if you'd like to get your own free copy of The Economist, we've got a little offer for you. You'll get one in the post, free through your door. All you have to do is text the word retro and send that to 78070. So if you want to get your free print copy of The Economist, text the word retro and send that to 78070. You'll get your copy through the mail and you'll be really helping out the Retro Hour podcast. Thanks to The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. So let's talk about this new Mega Drive clone. Is there finally a modern Mega Drive clone? that's worth our money. Yes, there is. So before we had the at games, consoles and all these rubbish ones. We've we talked about that. <laughs> yeah, which used to have awful quality noise and everything. Well, this is the genuine stuff. This is like absolutely amazing. Made by Analog. So okay, you, yeah, yeah. You heard of Analog NT before and that was a really accurate recreation of uh, the Nintendo consoles. So yeah. they, they also had a Famicom one as well, which was just absolutely awesome. Or SNES. And now they've released a Mega Drive one, so it's called the Mega SG. How much do you think this machine would kind of be? Well, looking at it, I mean, it, looking at the pictures, I haven't seen it in person, but it looks like it's a quality product. And I remember even like the, you know, the At Games ones, they were like $80 anyway. Yeah. And if you're talking about stuff like, you know, if it's got real proper HDMI, is it like 60 frames a second HDMI? Output? Yeah, yeah, 1080p. Yeah. It's um, really nice. It's got compatibility with all of the games, including the ones with the special chips that you yeah, had yeah. to put in but also it has mega cd compatibility oh, okay. so you can put it on the mega cd expansion it has this nice little kind of mat that you can put no, on like the original. yeah yeah <laughs> that's pretty but of course it's it's really tiny um another really amazing function of this is that uh it has these new controllers and these controllers uh look exactly like the kind of old school Mega Drive style. It's a six button style, isn't it? Six yeah, the button, one, yeah. But they have absolutely no lag at all on them. Yeah. And they're using the uh, 2.4G um, wireless. Right, okay. So, you know, I was watching Modern Vintage Gamers video and he was saying these would be good in the Amiga CD32 or any of yeah. these old consoles. You could put these wireless pads in and no longer have cables going everywhere. Right, I'm looking at this now because it plugs into the, the old uh, D-Sub connector, doesn't yeah, it? It's yeah. got the other, wow, okay, so you could use that technically with anything. But yep. Got that connector, that's but really But cool. also, it has adapters. Right. So the analog does the Sega Mark III, if you get the adapter, the Game Gear, Sega My Card, I've never even heard of My Card, <laughs> right. the SG-1000. Yeah, uh, Master System. And the SC-3000 as well. So it seems like there's compatibility for everything. Which is rare Apart on a clone. Apart from the 32X. Well, I'm reading the comments here, apparently they're working on that. Really? So, yeah, that, that could be something that's coming. Yeah, because uh, I, I, 
it might have been harder to implement that and stuff because it's it's total different hardware again, isn't it? Yeah, I mean you've got to wire up loads of stuff. You know, it's, but, a, yeah. it's a FPGA as well, so really it looks fast. Like, so I mean, even the fact that except I mean, I, I've got like a recently bought a 4K 65 inch Sony TV, yeah. Ultra HD, all that stuff hasn't got a SCART connector, no composite video, nothing like that. So hooking my old systems up to it, unless you want to go down like the the Frame Meister kind of route. Which I know you've got one of those, but then the Frame Meister has one frame of lag. Right. Okay. This, Which this kind of a lot. Yeah, this doesn't even have that. And how much is a Frame Meister? Oh, quite like, a bit. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And there's the OS uh, SC, which is the kind of it, it doubles the image uh, rather than scales it. But that's a little bit cheaper, but it's still quite pricey. So I mean, by the time you've got an original system and one of those. I imagine this at like, what is it, about $200? Yeah. It's not a cheap thing, but I think they've done it right. So if you want a modern Mega Drive system, it's going to be worth the and money. And the sound is beautiful as well. This is the thing, the sound is really good. And what you can do is you can turn the low-pass filter off. You can do loads of filtering effects on top of the videos as well. Oh, nice. So you can add your scan lines. You can even remove all the pixels if you want to do that. How dare you? <laughs> Ra- Ravi's eyeing this thing up for music DJ. I actually, really I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Analyze that sound already. So uh, it looks really good. I think they've done a, a nice job of the case and everything as well. It looks beautiful. I think. Yeah, yeah. They've got uh, three colors. So yep. it's, uh, well, four colors actually. It's for all the different regions. So you've oh, got cool. like a USA, EU, a Japanese one, and just a white one. I want the purple one, like, you know, the, the little purple, a bit like the, the Japanese one. Now, that was always my favourite Mega Drive. So I want to find out more about that. It looks awesome, this thing, actually, I've got to say. And it's good when someone actually does, like, a, you know, kind of a clone of an old system that's worth buying. So there's been so many bad attempts at the Mega Drive. So I want to find out more about the Mega SG. I'll put a link to that and all of the rest of this week's stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, let's talk about this really cool rare Sinclair ZX Spectrum prototype. Now, this is in the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge. And they've done this video kind of showing this is from 1981. Wow. This thing reminds me of, do you remember at school when you built, like, radios? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stuff yeah. Like that. It, it was all, like, copper wrapped around. Wire wrapped and, and stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. what I was thinking for. Um, but, yeah, it, it looks handmade, which I imagine it is. But this is, it's a fully functional 16K Spectrum. And it looks in, in incredible condition, for, yeah. considering how old it is. You know, they... they they were looking at it and they were saying, uh, the only thing that's missing is a couple of the stickers because it's actually, it hasn't got that rubberized keyboard yet. Yeah. It's got a real clicky clacky keyboard. Which is a positive, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then all the markings on each key are the exact same ones that they had on the rubber ones. But with stickers. Yeah. <laughs> so these stickers have been on there for like nearly 40 years. And a lot of them still survived. It looks in really good condition. It's got like um, ceramic chips in there as well that have been, you know, imagine like the reprogrammable chips that are in there. It's incredible how finished this looks. And apparently it will run, you know, a lot of the Spectrum software and everything. Yeah, and there's a wonderful video of it on Hackaday as well yeah. and on their YouTube channel that you can check out if you're really interested in that. You just know every Spectrum owner is going to be looking at that thinking, oh, I'd love to play Daily Thompson on that keyboard instead <laughs> yeah. of the rubber key thing. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to find out that, I'll put, I'll put the video in as well. It's worth a look in our show notes. Now, recently, Retro Gamer magazine, which uh, is a magazine I pick up most months, um, really good read. They did a feature last month all about the Bitmap Brothers. Oh, yeah. And well, obviously we've had, you know... Legendary company. Mike Montgomery's been on the show before. We've covered all their games and stuff in the past. And one of my all-time favourite games was Gods. I used to oh, love yeah. Gods back in the Gods day. Gods was awesome. Uh, Speedball 2 and Gods. I think the soundtracks and just the graphics were just, wow. All, they, that, all that shiny metal, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very cyberpunk, their games, weren't they? It was, you know, I was a huge fan of them back on the Amiga and the Atari ST. I obviously got a lot of those games too. And now Gods has got an HD remake. Now, this was also something that was in Retro Gamer last month. They kind of did like a couple of page feature. I looked at that and I thought, you know, we should get these guys on because yeah. it looks really cool. So let's go over to uh, Nils and Michael from Robot Riot, who are the guys behind this God's HD upgrade. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Hi. Hello, thanks. Now, you are behind this new remake of Gods. I mean, were you were you both, like, big fans of the original? What kind of memories have you got of the original Gods? Yeah, um, actually, it was uh, one of the uh, my favourite games on my Atari ST. I played it back then in the 90s, obviously, and uh, really liked uh, that game. So uh, a couple of years later, or actually 15 years later, so to say, we had the, the opportunity to get this license, and uh, it was a no-brainer for me to pursue that opportunity. So that was uh, how the whole project started. So when you're continuing Gods, you're kind of 
improving on some legendary stuff that was there anyway. Like the sound was amazing in Gods and the graphics. So how have you guys kind of remastered it and improved it? Well, uh, for me, obviously, uh, the decision was uh, to, in, in terms of graphics, to do some something new because um, the original pixel graphics were already so great that uh, I thought it would be uh, very difficult to top that. So we thought uh, making it, uh, uh, yeah, give it a, a totally new look with 3D graphics and uh, light and shadow and stuff like that. But uh, the original was also a little bit enhanced as it's part of the of the remastered version. So you can play the original Amiga graphics version. Um, the original uh, had only 17 FPS on a, on a European machine because uh, it was updated every third frame. And that was something we approved in the new version. So the, you have uh, smooth 60 FPS throughout the whole game. But uh, actually, that's pretty much it. So the whole gameplay and uh, pace is still intact. Well, one thing I loved about the original game was, you know, that, that amazing music that, you know, stuck in everyone's head who played the original game. And uh, Michael, you've done the, the, the audio for the, the new version of the game. Then what did you kind of look at and how inspired were you by the original? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the original music uh, on the Amiga, uh, I think it was one of the most popular pieces of, of game music ever made. So uh, I knew replacing this music would be some kind of crime. <laughs> so um, we, we tried our best to get the license of the original piece, uh, but unfortunately we, we didn't get it. So we, we tried about, I think, more than a year to, to get a license. But yeah, we didn't get it. So I knew whatever we will do, there will be fans that would not like whatever new piece would come in there we we were discussing uh, whether should we just just leave it out or do something completely different but in the end we decided to make something similar to the original piece mm -hmm. so yeah this is how it ended up and and by the way um in the first step we we actually made a cover version of the original that can be heard on soundcloud i can send you a link so um, yeah, we, we made something similar, and um, I guess most of the fans actually liked what we did. And um, in the original Amiga version, there was no music in the levels, and um, I I was always wondering why there's no music in it, because the sound effects were great and, and the graphics were perfect. So um, it was clear for me that we definitely needed some new music for the levels. As I didn't play the the uh, Atari version in these days, I, I didn't even know that there was music on the Atari ST. So I made something completely different, and uh, I went uh, for some shopping and, and bought some some instruments that were related to to Greek culture. And yeah, we we started up, and um, that's what you hear right now. Well, I mean, updating such a beloved game. I mean, it's always going to be, I imagine, quite a scary thing to do because you know people. Uh, that into the original it's steeped in nostalgia and you know it's really important to do it right i mean what, what's kind of the reaction been like then from uh, people that have played the game so far yeah actually uh, when we started the project and uh, or, or i started uh, doing this um dev blog on facebook quite early on and um you know not always the people get this that this is an evolving process so when you share the first graphics and there was uh, quite a lot of uh, negative feedback because it was just not finished mm -hmm. but i decided to talk about all the the problems we had and the ideas we were discussing and stuff like that actually that's what uh, what uh, is uh, dev blog is all about so but that uh, changed at some point. So when we reached uh, a, f or a final look of the game, the, um, the feedback of the fans actually turned quite positive. And um, since the game is out, uh, when you look at, for example, the Xbox rating, it's, it's quite good. So the people actually who care about the game really like what they got. And I'm seeing it's available, as you said, for the Xbox. Uh, Steam as well with full kind of Steam controller support and Steam Cloud, so you can have your online cloud saving. Um, right. What other platforms are you aiming for? Right now, um, as I said, um, it's, it's uh, a release is imminent for PS4 and Switch. It's on March uh, 29, that's already fixed. So all the certification is done and uh, we're actually uh, doing a bit of promotion right now and the game is going to be live. 
end of the month. And um, apart from that, um, we are probably uh, going to release a mobile version as well, but this is probably something uh, towards the end of the year. That's, I think the Switch is such a platform that you know retro games feel at home on as well. Right. Yeah, so I'm really excited to play it on there. Well, guys, listen, it's been amazing catching up with you. Um, if people do want to get hold of the uh, the remastered version of Gods uh, for the 21st century, we'll put a link in our show notes um, to where people can buy it from. And, uh, you know, it's great to see one of our favourite childhood games getting a bit of love and updated. So uh, keep up the good work, guys. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, before we get into our interview this week with uh, Steve McNeil, Let's talk about a classic first-person shooter. Do you remember in the mid-90s, so many FPSs came along after, like, Doom and Quake. Yeah. I remember stuff like, stuff like Heretic and Hexen. They were yeah. great games yeah. as well. And uh, Blood, that was a game that came out in 1997. Yeah, so there was a set of games that came out on Ken Silverman's engine, uh, yeah. which was called just the build engine at the end, which was what Duke Nukem 3D was yeah. based on. And that was, uh, do you remember Redneck Rampage? Yeah. That was all you go around and killing chickens and stuff. And then they, they had a Shadow Warrior as well. And Blood was one of them. Now, Atari uh, actually talking about redoing Blood at the moment. Right. Which is pretty cool, which is going to be a remake. But they're doing it with this company uh, called Night Dive. Now, I was just looking at Night Dive stuff and... This is such a cool motto for a company, bringing lost and forgotten gaming treasures back from the depths. And no, I, I, we like that. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that we really like. And I was looking at their projects, and they, they did System Shock, which is um, a very big popular pledge uh, that's currently coming out. So I think that they're going to deliver on this. But the list of games that they've got under their belt... Turok, Turok 2. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, all these, I guess, could be done in the future. Are they know? the guys who just released that on the... It came out the Nintendo Switch, didn't it, Turok? It got like a... There's an yeah, they, on they also yeah, okay. had um, Seventh Guest. Wow. They've got uh, the Eleventh Hour. There's there's lots of different titles here. Harvester, do you remember that one? No. No, but uh, it wasn't a harvesting game. <laughs> it was a, bit, <laughs> a farming one. But yeah, this company looks really interesting. Uh, I have no mouth and I'm a scream. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that's a messed up game. Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting to see that Atari are working with these guys and let's hope that we can see more titles coming out from beneath the depths. And I do love it when they upgrade old FPS games because, I mean, you know, you remember when you first saw this genre of gaming? I remember the first time I played Quake. You know, it blew me away. I'd never seen anything like that before. But now they're not quite as easy on the ice to play all these years later. It's, it's strange because... Original Duke Nukem, which was built on Ken Silverman's engine, I recommend yeah. everybody watches the history of the build engine, Ken Silverman's, because you can see the development of slopes, transparent walls, and all of this. But actually, the original Duke Nukem, you can put 24-bit skins on there. Okay. And uh, it's called Polymost, which is this like kind of shading, and you can get the original Duke Nukem up to like modern levels, uh, high 1080p resolution. No way. <laughs> all of this with the original engine. So I'm hoping that if they can kind of do this with blood, they might be able to just go, oh, let's just check out Redneck Rampage. Let's check out a few others on this engine. Well, if the engine was made to be scalable, yeah. And I mean, it does actually say here that one of the things they're promising is it's going to be have enhanced compatibility for modern Windows PCs. So hopefully that will see some improved features yeah. too. So. Or, or maybe crazy mods. You never yeah, know. yeah. That's always the best thing about those games, wasn't it? All the, the third party mods that you'd find on yeah. the internet and stuff. So yeah, if you want to find out more about that, I'll show that and everything else we've talked about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat with Steve McNeil, all about Go 8 Bit and these uh, amazing new projects he's working on, including his retro gaming book. Let's give a big mention to our good friends at Beer 52. Now, Beer 52, here's some words that are going to be music to your ears, especially if you know if you live here and the weather's getting a bit warmer now and you want to spend a bit of time out in the garden. Free beer. Oh, you know what I was doing the other night? I, yeah. was, I was DJing uh, for my 8-Bit Mix, 8BitMix.com, check it out. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there was a load of listeners in there and they're going... Enjoy my beer 52 whilst watching this mix. Nice. Wonderful combo. <laughs> I mean, come on. Does it get any better than this? A free case of craft beer. Thanks to our good friends at Beer 52. Now, all you have to do to claim this is nip onto the website. The link is beer52.com forward slash retro. So that's beer52.com forward slash retro to get your free case of beer. And like we said, you know, this being the first weekend of summer, if you live, you know, in Europe or the UK, it is, you know, the perfect chance to get some extra special beers in. Now, Beer 52, are the world's most popular monthly craft beer discovery club and they search out incredible 
exclusive small batch craft beers from the world's greatest breweries and bring them back to their members. So again, it's not the kind of stuff you're going to find in Morrison's down the beer aisle. You know, this is stuff that they have gone to ex- you know, massive lengths to try and find these for you. And at the moment, they're actually doing something really good. Citizens of everywhere. Now, because, you know, they're saying Europe has given us so much over the years. Could be stuff like booze cruises, exotic sausages, our royal family, for Brat- example. Brat first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but also, maybe the best thing has been the beer and breweries. You know, we love drinking, obviously, these amazing beers that we can get from Europe. And and homegrown stuff as well, which is why at the moment they're searching out the best European beers. So if you want to get hold of um, this case, not only will you get beers from all over Europe, but also they'll include their Ferment magazine as well, which is, I mean, I've read a couple of these now. You don't realise how interesting beer is until you start flicking through this magazine. You know, saying that actually, when we go, whenever we go to a retro event in any kind of place in Europe, there's always a brewery, and we always have to go yeah. and see the local brewery. <laughs> I think that's the thing. Gaming and beer just go hand in hand, don't they? So, if you want to get hold of a case of beer to try this out, I mean, you know, you might be a fan of dark beer or lighter beers, or maybe both, and get yourself a mixed case. All you have to do to get your first case for free, you just need to pay the five pound ninety five postage, and you will get eight incredible craft beers. They're for Met Magazine and a snack. In Included as well. Ooh. Perfect for the weekend with next day shipping. No brainer, really. No minimum commitment. Take the free case, try the beer, see what you think. If it's not for you, pause or cancel it. All you have to do to claim your case right now is head to beer52.com forward slash retro. Right then, time to get the inside story on the amazing Go 8 bit with this week's special guest, Steve McNeil. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is our favourite bit of the show now, where we welcome on this week's special guest, the man behind Go 8-Bit. Welcome to the show, Steve McNeil. Thank you for having me. It's very nice to be here. Great to have you joining us. Now, obviously, Go 8-Bit was such a big TV show, um, ran for three series on Dave, and uh, the show that in recent years got retro gaming back onto mainstream TV, so we will talk all about that in just a minute. But, I mean, just talking about you, Steve, I mean, what's kind of your gaming background? What got you into this crazy world of games? I've never not had games. So the first, the first, um, first console we had in our house was a, a Pong. It was a Adman Grandstand TV game 2000 because I'm older than you, I'm guessing. So we had Home Pong was the first thing. And then um, an Amstrad CPC uh, 464 uh, was first computer set. And then all the way through. So it was mainly computers. It was the Atari ST, the Amiga, but also consoles from the SNES. I was always Nintendo. So from SNES onwards, I sort of had Nintendo. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've never not had games Ever. So it's you great. were a kind of Nintendo fanboy, but did you also have a system that you just really desired or drooled over? I don't know if I was a Nintendo fanboy. Nintendo was just better. Um, so the, it just had more colours and it had Mario Kart on it. So there was there was nothing really on sake on the Mega Drive for me. I think most of the guys that I was at school with as well, they were all Nintendo. So I, I, I never really had that affinity with... Um, uh, Sonic or Shinobi or any of those things. I thought you'd be more annoyed when I just said Nintendo, so I can only assume you guys are all in Nintendo now. <laughs> <laughs> we like to remain impartial. We have um, we have another co-host called Joe, who's like the biggest Sega fanboy ever, but he's not here today. So uh, Oh, great, perfect. Yeah, yeah Sega's rubbish. No, so. no, no one smashed up the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you watch much gaming TV when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, of course. it was. I mean, Games Master was the one when I was a kid, mm-hmm. which, um, the, you know, the, the original um, sort of slogan on the posters for Gate, but when we started as a live show was Games Master drunk in a cupboard uh, was sort of the pitch for it so it was un- unashamedly uh, paying tribute to that and then um, obviously Games World as well on Sky and all the Big Boy Barry stuff uh, who I've been lucky enough to work with sort of since but um, if, if uh, and even the computer channel I don't know how old you guys are but the computer channel was another thing that was sort of this weird cable channel that was only on for like two hours a day but they, they used to put stuff on that and um, you just sort of you sort it out where you could find it digitized as well, like Teletext. I know that's incredibly old, but uh, like you get the, get the digitizer pages on Teletext and uh, yeah. get the reviews and the tips and things. It was um, yeah, didn't didn't have the, uh, didn't have the luxury of the internet. So if there was anything that existed that had video games in it, you just sort of gobbled it up because it was it was all you were going to get. And there was this kind of period where video game television, you know, disappeared for a long while. I think the last thing that I remember seeing was a. Uh, Fun Bandits, or around that period of time, as a kind of right, a mainstream yeah. game show. Yeah, it's sort of every couple of years, Telly has a go at it, but it's um. Like, I, I imagine, it, I imagine if you drew like a timeline of it, there's pro- there's probably never a time when there hasn't been a, uh, one or two shows on Telly that are about video games, but that they're often buried on on the lower end channels and they're made for pennies and peanuts. So it's, you, I don't, I don't think. 
there's been many shows other than Games Games Master, because even Games World was just Sky. I think Games Master was the only one really that was mainstream enough that most people were at least aware of it, even if it wasn't for them. So it's te- telly's ne- never really given it the platform. And I it, it guess deserves. you were really reliant on it when you were a kid because that was like your primary information source. I remember watching one called Cyberzone that was on really late at night, but I'd just right. stay up to watch it. <laughs> it was, was only that, was that... five seconds of a video game clip, but you know, <laughs> till 3am. Right, right, right. Yeah. How, how old are you guys? Late 30s. Oh, all right, yeah. so we are about the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, fair enough, I'll stop, yeah. I'll stop feeling so sorry for myself. Then. Fine, <laughs> you're right too. But yeah, I mean, I remember like, you know, watching like, Games Master and Bad Influence as well. It used to be on um, ITV. Um, yeah, bad, see, Bad Influence is one I never saw this one. I've gone back and looked at it since, obviously, because yeah. of what I do. But uh, Bad Influence sort of passed me by with Violet Berlin and all that. But that was, yeah, that, that was that was another good one, for sure. So were you always kind of a, a performer, or did you always want to be on television? <laughs> no. No, I um, I was I never really did any of that at school until I was I think I was about fifteen or sixteen, and there was a like a school musical audition came up and I, I just went along with a mate because he didn't want to go on his own and um, then ended up getting a part in the play and sort of then got a taste of it because I um, if if anybody's familiar with me, I've I've always looked like me and that was not um, good in terms of meeting women, so uh, being in being in a, being in a musical, um, all of a sudden I had a I had a discernible skill that was attractive and that sort of helped so i guess i sort of clung to that like a life raft in the hopes that women might like me so that was that that that, that was my uh big beginnings of performing was doing guys and dolls at school and then um i went i, I, I went, did a management degree when i went to university uh but uh, sort of did amateur dramatics for years it was, I, was, I was 26 before i went to theater school you started working at jinx as a contributor how, how did you um get that role then and how did you progress to being on the screen i try to remember now jinx, jinx is a weird one because um uh, me and uh, Sam Pamphlon, the other guy from Go 8 Bit, the other team captain, we were, we were a sketch comedy double act. Um, and it's, it's really random. We we um, we occasionally got brought in by the National Film and Television School to just like be pretend people in things so that the camera students could learn how to focus cameras and sort of shoot stuff. And so on one occasion, I was in there doing a, like a pretend chat show, basically. Um, so I was one of the guests in this pretend chat show so they could film sort of live multicam stuff and uh, David McClellan who hosted Planet of the Apps on Jinx happened to be the host for that and he just mentioned uh, that he worked at Jinx and then um, they, it, he, it was just before we did the first ever Go 8-Bit live show so uh, it was in July 2013 and he brought everyone from Jinx along to the first ever Go 8-Bit and then they started talking to us about maybe they'd like to make it, but Jinx had got no money, so that wasn't viable. But what what they did do was obviously have all the reviews and um, features and things on the channel, so they couldn't afford to make Go 8-Bit, but they saw that I was a comedian that liked games of, of sufficient quality to allow me to start writing for them. So I began as a writer, writing... Um, uh, features for the original version of Video Game Nation. So not the one John, Dan and Aoife were in, but the original, original, original one with um, Tom Deacon and I cannot remember her name, which is very bad. But um, there, there were two different hosts when that show started, Video Game Nation, which was made by Jinx. And I just wrote sort of features for them to do voiceover, was how I started. And Video Game and Nation, eventually... it was an interesting show. Because that was like kind of, you know, gaming coming back on TV. I mean, that was, I remember a lot of people used to watch that that I knew. I think for, for, me, for me, it's the, in, in terms of a show that doesn't condescend to the audience and actually covers games properly, for me, it's, and it's not because I'm in it, I just turn up and said stupid stuff for two minutes a week. But that, that show was great. It really deserved a better audience and a better shot because um, if you were actually into games, it was, you know, it was contemporary. Everybody on it actually knew what they were talking about and it didn't try to explain what a shoot 'em up was. I thought, I thought, I thought Video Game Nation was a great show. I was really gutted when it ended because it's um it's like go eight bits stupid it's fun i'm proud of it but go eight bits a panel show video game nation was a proper tv show about games it's a show there's, there's nothing like it now oh, i was gonna say it's quite interesting that you you kind of had comedians and stuff there do you find much crossover with the world of gaming and the world of comedy yeah, because like comedians only work an hour a day, so most <laughs> most most comedians have got uh, time to kill, and games are fun. So a, a lot of comedians uh, play games. A lot of them, like Brendan Burns, who was a guy whose show I was in years and years ago. Like he always takes his Xbox on tour with him and sort of takes the console and just pl- plugs it into the hotel telly. And a lot of comics do that. Or now, nowadays, everybody's got a Switch. But um, yeah, it, it, most comedians have. Um, well, they've not grown up and they've got loads of time on their hands. So it's a, it's a really good crossover. <laughs> Goes um, hand in hand. Yeah, I think so. 
Well, you've also done features for, uh, you know, like Vice Gaming and um, London Economic and Time Out. How did you kind of get involved in writing then? I asked them if they'd give me some money and they were foolish enough to say yes, so then I did it. I, I, I wish there was a better story behind that, but it was because uh, I'd been writing the stuff for Jinx. Um, well, well, what it was really was I because I worked in fitness club franchising for about 10 years uh, while I was being an out-of-work actor and comedian and then uh, making things like Go 8-Bit. And with the writing work at Jinx, eventually that became enough of a regular piece of work that I managed to jack in the day job and, and do it full-time. But then as, as things ebbed and flowed, <clears throat> excuse me, with what Jinx needed of me, then I could... Um, I'd sort of, sort of, if I needed more money and what hadn't got enough work, I'd then go, well, look, here are examples of me saying words on pages. Can you let me do that for you, please? So it was all, always on spec. Just if I'd got a bit of free time and I needed a bit more cash, I'd just harass everybody. And so the ones that you've listed are the ones that were kind enough to give me their money. But it was uh, ent- entirely a cash grab, although not a lucrative one, I can assure you. I don't know if, you've, I don't know if you guys have ever written for... Uh, things like that but there's, there's there's not a lot of money in that <laughs> now every everybody i've met who was in games journalism's left it pretty much unless they're a, like staff because it's it pays appallingly so um where did the idea of you two guys just kind of collaborating and getting these comedians to play games on stage when was that formed was it just like one night where you were like right let's do this yeah, I think I think the, the initial seed of the idea came from me, and I, and I think it, I, I think initially I kicked it around with another comedian, a guy called Guy Kelly, who um, was in a sketch group called the Beta Mouse, who we who we'd gigged a lot with, and um, it would. Th- there's lots of format shows. There are lots of like late night things like Go Eight Bit that happen in Edinburgh every year, where comedians just organise a late night thing at the weekend for fun. And I was into games, and we just sort of figured if well if we get comedians drunk and get them to swear at each other while they battle on Street Fighter or Mario Kart. Video games are entertaining to watch anyway, and comedians are funny. So if we slam the two together with booze at midnight, we only did it in a 50-seater room, but we figured there'd be 50 nerds in Edinburgh who'd be similarly inclined to be up at a pay to watch it. But it, there, were, there was no no plan to do anything with it. It was purely to just make the week a bit more bearable because we'd got a silly thing to look forward to where we could just drink vodka and play Tetris. Um, and then almost inevitably that then became far more successful than anything else we'd done. Well, how did it kind of grow into the show then? Well, it, it, I mean, it, it arrived fully formed. I mean, the, the, the first the first Go 8 bit was pretty much the format as it as it remained up until we made the TV show. We sort of lost these sort of forfeits and the the, the sort of um the, the sort of lancier elements of the show. But it 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 was comedians come on battle on games and the lo- and the loser gets punished. The winner scores points and um it very it went very well the first year. We were, we were 2013. We were up there. At every show sold out. So we had another show. Then we had a residency in London. Um, and that that was always standing room only as well. Um, guy guy called Rob Sedgbeer, who's the guy who's the genius behind the Wi-Fi Wars thing that I, I'm now involved in. He um, he was the boyfriend of a girl who was a fan of ours when we did sketch comedy, and he'd created this technology that allowed the uh, audience to log in and play on their phones with the game. So he said, "Do you want to use this?" And we said, "Yes, we do," and sort of roped him in, and it just sort of it sort of took on its own momentum, and then project actually. But the guy who took it on to develop it for TV actually took it on. I think it was October we signed the deal, so it only existed for about three months. And um, he was he was the director of that Brendan Burns show I'd been in in 2007. And he'd, um, he directed me and Sam's show in 2012, and sort of we, we were friends, we kept in touch. And he was a big gamer too, so he managed to find us a little bit of development money to try to develop it. So it all, actually, having spent years and years trying to get sitcoms away and trying to get the sketch comedy stuff going, is when Go 8-Bit happened, it all sort of, uh, in telly terms, happened very, very quickly. It, it was... Uh, and you know you say kind of very, very quickly, if you think about guys kind of making a video and then just uploading it to YouTube, there's no real process or big discussions or anything like that. Um, how no. long was the kind of transition from stage to television and how long did that process take of everybody yeah. discussing stuff and getting everybody happy? Yeah, well, we we did the first preview ever of Go 8 Bit. It was the 2nd of July in 2000, of 2013. I don't know why I remember that date, but I do. But it was 2nd of July 2013. So it was, it was in the month before Edinburgh in, in August. Um, the show got picked up formally for development in October of that year. And then we spent two and a bit years developing the show. I think in summer 2014, we filmed a pilot a live pilot at the place where Dave Gorman's show, Modern Life is Good, used to be filmed. So we sort of piggybacked on all his lights and tech that he had there. Um, so about it was about a year from it being uh, picked up to filming this pilot, and then about another year and a bit before they finally gave it the nod. And that was that was really when we got Dara on board um, that, that swung it. it. It took a long time to get telly to look at it and take it seriously. Because um, the received wisdom in telly 
then and arguably still now is that video games doesn't work on telly um and so no every, every month we do a new show in london at the residency uh so that we could show it off the telly and every month then no one would turn up so there'd be no execs would bother to turn up we would be sold out and it'd all go great but no one from telly would actually show up it was very, weird, very isn't it? It. yeah it is <laughs> <laughs> Sort of me and Sam joke about being bulletproof in terms of career longevity and success because no, if we're attached to it, it will tank. <laughs> that far, regard, regardless of quality, it's doomed if we're anywhere near it. But um, but go eight bit eventually, thankfully, did stick. I mean, when did you first meet Darren? What what got him involved next? I remember you know reading some some stuff on like Twitter and that people being like you know he's an unusual choice for a video game show, but actually he, he is a gamer, isn't he, Darren? No, he's a proper gamer. Yeah, yeah. We, he hosts like the BAFTA Games Awards every year. Yeah. He's um yeah, big game. He's got an arcade cabinet in his house. He's um you know he's doing very well. Uh, but um he'd been uh, uh we knew of him as a gamer. You know, there's people like him, Jonathan Ross, Charlie Brooker. There's a few high profile sort of comedy personalities in the UK who who were also gamers. And um, Dara, Dara was a the best fit because as well as loving games, uh, he also, obviously, obviously with Mock the Week and other shows, he's an exceptional host, particularly of panel shows. And so our producer um, flirted with him for ages, uh, taking him out for dinner and trying to convince him to put his name to it, which he, which eventually he did. Um, the thing that got him over the line was uh, we, we did a show, I think it was the last one we did, December 2015, and uh, we, we had one of Rob's uh, interactive phone games. We used to use them in Go 8-Bit, um, where basically you get like a, a, a secret code and you have to type it in quickly. Um, and it, we'd like shuffle the keypad and do tricks and mesh, mesh it around. And um, sorry, I've just bunked my mic. And uh, Dar- Dara was playing along sort of in the corner, being as, in, as discreet as he could be for a you know, seven-foot man with a big hat. Um, and uh, when he went out in the game, when he uh, screwed it up, he 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 leapt up and roared his disgust, and that was uh, that was the moment that we knew that we got him because he was totally uh, invested in the mischief. He was he was a big champion of Rob's when we did the TV show as well, in terms of the way that we used Rob's tech. It's um, yeah, but yeah, we 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 are we begged him to for ages, and eventually he relented. <laughs> is how we got Dara, and he was the right choice. You know, he's he's. A, I know. Um, as with as with anybody with his profile, that for 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 every tweet that sings his praises, there'll be another one calling him an arsehole. But that's just sort of the nature of success. But he's inarguably uh, the best person for that job. I think he proved it in the show. Well, when you kind of talked about this show on stage, um, it seemed a lot more kind of retro than it did on television. Was there like a bit of a demand for having uh, more modern titles in there? Yeah, a little bit. I think. I think. Uh, so, so, I mean, the li- the live show, we could sort of do whatever we wanted and be a bit more niche with it because we, you know, our audience was gamers, and it didn't it didn't have to have that broad appeal. Whereas I think the intention with the TV show was to try to cover all areas of gaming. Um, but not that that's a bad thing. I think you know the the sort of the routine we got into was that we'd start with like a proper classic retro gaming round one, let the guests pick whatever they fancied for for their choices but then also as well as having a modern game have an indie game as well and you know one of the nicest things about go 8 bit was that when when we did have games like say overcooked or what the box or um oh what's it a human full flat games like that when they like the uh, gang beasts i mean there's loads but those sorts of games really like several developers have sort of independently told me that the impact that being on the show had on the sales, because in terms of getting visibility on a platform like Steam, it's almost impossible to break through. And um, not that those games I've said aren't big games, but uh, that having that level of um, coverage on, on, on telly was was incredibly helpful in uh, getting people to buy their games. So that was uh, one, of, one of the positives of it, was, was giving a platform for those sorts of games, which nowhere else ever really looks at. Because if you have got a half-hour show on TV about games, it's going to be about Grand Theft Auto mm. and Call of Duty because they're the biggest ones. Did you find any people were kind of confused about the title? You know, go a bit expecting it all to be like you know really old games. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, the, yes. I mean, the, the reason. I mean, for, for the, there will be one or two people listening to this who still won't have got it. It's just a crap pun but no with every, with every every single time the episode went out people would point out that all the games weren't 8 bit and there's a there's a level of sort of uh, there's a lack of self awareness in oneself to not go it's just it's just a word related to games and they've done a thing it it, it doesn't have to all be 8 bit games but there there were certainly that militant subset that we've all encountered on forums <laughs> on the internet who maybe take themselves a little bit too seriously yeah you um got Ellie Gibson as the kind of 
Games Master and she would come out with the trivia and stuff. And she got quite a lot of slack online, actually, which I, I think it wasn't really deserved. Do you think that's kind of part and parcel uh, of... Ellie, uh, Ellie, Ellie Gibson is legitimately one of the best games journalists our country's ever produced, and she's also an incredibly funny woman, as proven yeah. by the awesome Scummy Mummy show that she does. Unfortunately, um, there is a subset of gamers that is incredibly toxic, that if they see a woman anywhere near games, they choose to be an absolutely dreadful to them. And unfortunately, Ellie... Uh, as any, you know, you look at people like Julia Hardy or Aoife Wilson or any of those guys, the, their notifications on Twitter are horrific um, uh, for no other reason than because of their gender. It's, it is heartbreaking. But it's, it's also the reason that we were very, very keen on the TV show too, because Ellie wasn't involved in the live show. Mm. And uh, we wanted to make sure we had a strong female presence within the show, not just with Ellie, but also with the guests, making sure we'd always got sort of female representation. Um, yeah, because, so it's not the kind of boys club with a... Uh, no. Yeah. And no, really um, reflects but, gaming. Which, yeah. Indeed, but you know, I it, it is uh, uh, th- th- those people just won't shut up or go away. Well, in terms of guests that you did have on the show, I mean, uh, kind of, you know, if you got a guest on who wasn't a gamer or was a gamer, I mean, how much influence did they have on the games that they were going to play, and could they kind of request a game? But, yeah, they absolutely, they absolutely could, and we tried to tailor it to it as much as we could. I mean, games clearances was um, incredibly problematic on the TV show so in, in terms of the way that. Um, it was chosen to negotiate agreements for usage. Um, we, it sort of became a noose around our neck a little bit on Guy a bit. So the, more often than not, we, we'd have a go at getting the game. But if we couldn't, we'd sort of got the list of games that we could actually play and encourage them to find one that suited them more. But um, I think the, so, so, so sometimes we made it a bit harder for them in that regard. But also, we, 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 I've talked about this in loads of different places, but we, we had a real issue with lag in the studio they never gave us monitors in the desk and the, the way um the way it worked was that like the gaming pcs and the kit was underneath the desks where we we're sat but then the video feed from that had to go about 400 meters out of the studio up all into the gallery to be mixed and then sent back to the big screen which is what we play games on and so particularly with emulation of things like chucky egg with susan Kalman or um uh, Gran Turismo with Zoe Lyons, like when she's just doing donuts in a tunnel. I I I, I got reasonable at correcting for that because the amount of time I spent on the studio and on the show. But uh, you know, all of those guests that got uh, grief online for it obviously not being their favourite game in inverted commas. They all they were all perfectly solid at them backstage in the uh, sort of green room where we got the toy set up. It was just we sort of set them up to fail a little bit. But uh, that's the thing. The... Sa- sadly, sadly, that was out of my hands. I was I was I was a, a passionate advocate of not having lag to play games but uh, some some of the non-gaming contingent failed to recognise the importance of that <laughs> yeah got it. it can make such a massive difference I think I got like uh, one of those you know the competition pro USB joysticks they released a couple of years ago and there was a yeah. little problem it introduced like maybe just a couple of millisecond lag but I was trying to all these games yeah it's like yeah. You, you know you don't realise but it really throws you off and imagine all the equipment in a TV studio as well that could create interference and you know god yeah that yes that, that's the nice thing about the new the, the newer projects that i'm working on is that actually um i think i think what we've managed to do with go eight bit it was still a good show and a lot of people liked it but um but by demonstrating uh categorically the uh, deficiencies in that show people are more inclined now to listen to us when we uh, propose better alternatives so yeah. that's nice so that that was my next question do you think that go eight bits kind of opened up um the opportunity for more gaming at television to arrive and <laughs> No, it's still really hard. Um, I, I, I'm getting close on a couple of different things, but um, I, I thought, because going did very well in terms of viewing figures, um, especially for Dave as a channel, um, but it has not reassured television executives of the viability of gaming as a thing, which is even more strange now, because like when, when I think back to when we started doing Great Bit 2013, things like Twitch and, I mean, even like YouTube gaming stuff wasn't, as big a thing then it's so even you know there, there isn't anybody that isn't aware of youtubers and influencers being a thing now i don't think i think it sort of entered the sort of cultural mainstream the idea of people existing online and creating content yeah. um but it didn't really five six years ago so i already knew from watching twitch that it was fun just to watch games even if nobody was funny um because that is a thing because twitch um but telly didn't know that then it's 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 increasingly hard to credibly argue that telly isn't aware that 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 world and that platform exists and yet it still maintains the uh reticence that it had several years ago which i if anything i would have thought that would have made it easier for me but it, it certainly isn't um and you know i'm i'm the guy who made go 8-bit 
trying to uh, create a new thing um, in that environment. And it, it is no easier getting to, uh, another show away uh, than it was um, getting great. But the, the only thing that's different is that now people are more inclined to defer to my judgment on the nature of the show. But it's not any easier to get it greenlit than it ever was, which is sad. But I really want to do it because it's fun. And you think, you know, in terms of watching other people game, I mean, that kind of goes back to the arcades when you look at a good games player over the shoulder and, uh, you, you know, it kind of goes back to the start of gaming, really, that people always enjoyed observing it's, it. It's, it's demonstrably a thing. I mean, this is why well, like, I've been working quite a lot with ESL recently and it's, and it's lovely because I came from the world of comedy and then uh, made video gaming things. And so I've constantly throughout my career had to convince people games are entertaining, whereas working with um, an, uh, an institution like ESL, um, it's lovely because the, con- the conversation has already begun from the fact that everyone in the room understands the inherent entertainment value of gaming. So then you can talk about how creatively you deliver that and what sort of things you might want to do for mischief or whatever. And it's lovely to – most of my time is taken up convincing people it'll be okay if we put games on a thing. Um, and so it's it's been liberating to work with people where that difficult and – all too often had conversation isn't required so you can just focus on creatively making something fun so um so i'm i'm really enjoying working with people who get it i did hear that you you found out the show was being cancelled via twitter yeah sort of yeah what happened there? I, we, we we'd had murmurings that maybe things weren't looking too good but uh it was uh it was through Bizarrely, somebody had tweeted the channel out because people were always asking the channel, "Oh, when's it coming back? What's what's happening with Great Bit?" Um, and for some reason, the whoever because they they outsourced their social media stuff, so whoever whatever third party they were paying to manage their channel took it upon themselves to categorically announce that Great Bit had been canned, which actually wasn't and still isn't the case. Um, but uh, due to a poor briefing and uh, an overreaching on behalf of. Some poor bugger is probably getting paid 10 quid now to look at 30 different social media accounts. Um, that was, I was tagged into that and thus thus told in that way that the show was not coming back. Um, but uh, it, it, I, I'd already got a fair inkling that it wasn't. I was already beginning work on other things, but uh, that was the uh, that was the red line. Although it's since turned out in the aftermath when I had subsequent conversations with higher up people involved that actually it wasn't as um certain as that tweet made it look but yeah that was a, i was on holiday with my wife it was a really fun way to find out oh god <laughs> <laughs> well but, talking yeah. of other things as well you got involved in the christmas lectures yeah that well that well that was off that was again was off the back of go eight bit because what uh when it was the same weekend we filmed the tv pilot the go eight bit we'd also got our residency across town and, and me and rob were adamant we were still going to do the residency because um that's how we made money because the the residency sold tickets um and so we we sort of shipped up all the kit from the dress rehearsal from the from the t- from the uh, pilot went across town did a gig then packed it all up and drove it back for the for the pilot the next day which was a pain in the ass but someone who was involved in the christmas lectures happened to be at that gig and saw us doing this thing that we used to do in the live version of great bit where we would uh, stick a comedian on a virtual reality roller coaster and uh, make them hold a tray of champagne glasses while they while they rode around just to try to sort of show how it messes with your head and so they happened to be doing um that, that year's Christmas lectures were about perception and they wanted to use virtual reality. So then we met, um, I think it was Danielle, wasn't it? Danielle George was the professor that year. Uh, met up with her and uh, they, they sort of got us on. So originally that should have been, I think we're even introducing it as Go 8-Bit, but it's just me and Rob because uh, Sam wasn't available. Um, and it was off the back of that that we then spoke to the Royal Institution about um, the technology Rob had developed with the smartphone gaming and that's and so that's how what because wi-fi wars is residency is at the royal institution that's where we develop our new games and then we, we're going to do our fifth annual lecture there in the summer program this year which is insane um you know it's the, it's the place where faraday told everyone about electricity and we go there and play pong <laughs> but it's uh it's it's crazy. A, really, a really clever version of pong that rob has made that no one else on the planet has managed to do but nevertheless it does uh we, we were there on friday we we're doing our debug night on friday and it you do have to pinch yourself when you're walking in through Mayfair to go and do that in that place. It's an incre- incredible honour to get to be involved with that place. Yeah, However, people weird. don't know what the um, Christmas lectures are. They're basically a set of lectures by the Royal Institute um, for children and they kind of make science really good fun, but they're broadcast on the BBC, and I, I used to watch them every year. It kind of be well, like... Well, they've been going for about 180 years, and it is, if you look at the list of people who've hosted the, the Christmas lectures, it is absurd. 
Um, so to to have actually been in one of those and been a part of that was for, for you know for me and Robbie were two massive nerds was an incredible honour and the fact the fact that then we've you know continued that relationship for five years and it's it has become Wi-Fi Wars is home is um, yeah I'm very very lucky that I get to do what I do I constantly I constantly check myself for that it's uh, it's crazy. Well, tell us about Wi-Fi Wars then because that, that's a that's a really cool concept. It is, yeah, and I, and, I, and again, I only say that because it's not mine. It's it's Rob. He's, I just shout while we do it. But um, uh, when when Rob came to us in it would have been September two thousand and thirteen, so very very early on, he came to us and said, "Look, I've made this thing that I think you might like to use in the show because it's fun." And what he built was a version of Pong where uh, the audience could log in through a sort of closed Wi-Fi network he stuck in the room and then go to a web page and he would beam buttons into the, their phone through the web browser so the the audience could, as the ball was moving towards either the blue team's paddle or the red team's paddle, they press which direction they think it needs to go and if the majority of the team pick the correct direction, it moves into place and hits the ball. So it's sort of a mass multiplayer playing a single game of Pong. Um, and when he brought it to us, it worked with about six people. And we said, well, fine, you can try it out at our gig and we'll sort of, you know, we'll build it into the show as a, we've got this nerd who's trying to do a thing and made it a bit fun. The first time he did it, it didn't work. Um, but he kept working on the code and bringing it back. And eventually um, that extended so that in our second Edinburgh show, 2014, the finale of the show was Pong. Um, so we'd had comedians playing games uh through the show but the final game we handed over to the audience to let them all play the final game uh through this tech and what we also did which was a thing that went through at the tv show was we allowed the audience to score points during the show by guessing who they thought was going to win in each round so if they guessed correctly who was going to win in each game they'd accumulate individual points and as a result they could win the show so that sort of the vote in go eight bit is a hangover from that we sort of lost the um audience score element and it just became a way of setting points it sort of lost a little bit of the point of it in the transition to telly but that 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 voting mechanic was there from the very almost the very beginning as a way to allow the audience to effectively play the show um and then after we did the christmas lectures at the royal institution we 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 couldn't believe we'd been at the royal institution and we wanted to go back so we said rob's got this technology he's invented that lets an audience play the things could we come and give a talk about that and they Call, they called our bluff and said yes you can have a lecture in the summer program about this amazing thing you've created but at the time all robert got was a vote and pong working with about 50 people so we then we rob then had to retrospectively invent the technology we would pretended he created so that we could give a lecture about it so rob had about four months to invent a suite of games and other toys using that tech that allowed us to do an hour-long lecture and so in that first year it was all button games so just buttons in web pages. So it was two feet for a track and field and you'd run left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right to, to run. Or there'd be a grid of nine buttons to correspond to nine whack-a-mole holes and you'd play a game of whack-a-mole. Um, and he got that working. So that worked with about 300 people. And then since then, he's developed it in lots of different ways. So we now, rather than have the game on the screen and they all play with the buttons, uh, we can beam games into your phone. And that's everything from something like Space Invaders that you play on your phone and you will score an individual score and collectively your team scores points, all the way up to VR using Google Cardboard or um, a 3D first-person shooter that they all deathmatch against each other. So really incredibly advanced stuff um he's got it working online now so we can do it as an online show where people can watch on twitch live and play all the games in the twitch stream and win a game if they're the best we do we're doing that twice a week on our twitch channel at the moment um and he can even make the venue compete against the people watching online so we can have the studio audience compete against the world watching the live broadcast that we do it, it sounds fantastic because like audience participation is usually like put your hand up or phone a friend or you know 50 50 it's not the um kind of uh, huge gaming section no it's uh it is it is staggering what he's achieved and it is it, it fundamentally changes what you what you think of as that's sort of the benchmark for what interactivity is um and again i say that because i can't take any credit for it it is all it is all that man you know the best place to use that would be festivals where everybody's waiting for a gig <laughs> yeah, we'll play a big it, well, game. well, this yeah. is it. It is, it is things like it's things like that. It's um, queues at fun fairs. Um, uh, it's any sort of place where there's, there there are people waiting around because every, everybody's got the technology they need in their pocket, just ready to go. Well, tell us about this new show that you've um, brought to the stage: the video game game show show. <laughs> <laughs> the video game game show show that's right um well done uh the video game game show show is the culmination of all me and rob's work really so 
obviously the Go 8 bit was a show that we worked on for years. There's Wi-Fi Wars, which I've talked about. We do another thing called Pub Quiz, which is um, uh, is literally just a series of quiz rounds, but we get comedians to come up with the questions and sort of comedically host individual rounds. So sort of a, a mixed bill night. Uh, and what the video game game show show is, is it's a blend of all the toys and shenanigans that me and Robert developed over the last few years. So it is... Um, it is comedians uh, competing on classic games. It is the audience voting on who they think is going to win. It's the audience playing some of those games. There are quiz rounds. Um, there are stand-up or sketch comedy sets from comedians during the show. Um, and so in every way that we like to entertain an audience playing video games, the Video Game Game Show show is our, our little place for that. And we just do it once every couple of months in London purely. Again, in the same way we did with Go 8-Bit, it was about going back to the spirit of that after... Uh, everything we went through we're getting going on telly so it's just one, once every couple of months just in, in the basement of a pub near oxford circus just uh, get drunk get a couple of funny people in and just play some games with uh, whoever wants to come and join in it's it's loads of fun well you also wrote a book as well a retro gaming book i mean what, what kind yeah of nearly, that's, that, that nearly killed me yeah it comes out <laughs> next month finally yeah don't ever write a book don't ever write a book it's horrible well, there's horrible. A, a lot of kind of retro gaming titles out there and um, what what kind of sets this book apart i I've re- I've researched the hell out of it. I've re- I've read everything about retro games there is. There's not a book or a thing of note that I've not read to write that book. And as with Go 8-Bit, and I think it comes across a lot of stuff, I really care about games and I'm passionate about them and their ability to sort of transform and inspire and all of those things. And I didn't want to just write a, ha, 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 this is the funny thing that happened when I was 14 when I played a game or cl- cliched humour. So I was determined to write a legitimately comprehensive history of games because there are there aren't really there's not that many books about that that properly cover the history of games anyway but the ones that do as i've now discovered necessarily choose to limit their scope so they might focus on consoles or arcades or the the u.s scene or japan or or um they might focus on uk computing but many of them if, even if they do cover all those, they, they focus on one and allude to others. I, what I wanted to try to do was for that period of games, which is, which is everything from the beginning until Ocarina of Time comes out, basically, the end of 1998. Yeah. Um, I wanted to try to tell the history of all video and computer games. Obviously, not every single game, but there, there were lots of different places where different things were happening on different platforms at different times. But if you dig for it, there, 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 there are links and there are ways that things cross over and people that began on, say, the demo scene in Europe uh, when they was cracking games back in the early 80s, you find those guys drifting through to publishers who then eventually migrated from 16-bit computers to, say, 32-bit consoles. And it, It's about people and it's about um, the, the, the individuals and the companies behind those games that are created. And I think... I successfully managed to tell that story. And that's what I've tried to do. And that was hard in and of itself because I had a very tough year personally last year. We had a lot of very difficult things um, happen to people close to us last year. So it was a very stressful year anyway. Um, but the level of research I had to do to, to tell that story, I vastly underestimated the amount of work it was going to take. But I think I've done it. The people who've read it that I've given it to that I trust like it. The thing that made it so hard was not only did I have to do that, I then had to make it funny. Mm. Um, books are really big. So it was... I re- if you if you choose to read it, which I hope you will, I, I hope you'll feel I achieved my goal. But it really is to if if, if what I, my 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 bet my hope for it would be if in ten years time there are people that are studying game design or anything of that nature at a university, I'd like to think that my book would be the one they pick up if they want to get a good grounding in everything that happened up to that point, but in a more accessible, easy to read way. I think it's quite digestible because of the humour and the and the lightness that I've sort of tried to put across it. I uh, I that 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 is the lofty aspirations I have for that book because I certainly uh, I certainly really really tried to make it that good. And the thing about it is, I mean, you know, when you've got a book, it's it's written down. It's there in print forever, isn't it? It's not like a, a website article where you can change stuff if you get it wrong. So I imagine the pressure is on to research it to the nth degree. Yeah, and there will be stuff wrong with it. I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be things wrong with it that if I do a second edition, I can tidy up. And I'm, I'm sure people will pick me up on bits and bobs where I've got inaccuracies or whatever. But um, I've, I've done everything I can to make that not a thing. But certainly, certainly in the writing of it, even um, like obviously I do a lot of live shows and, you know, you do a gig and then it's you might have had a bad gig, but it's gone. It just disappears into the ether. And even something like a TV show, it's, it does exist, but it's most people aren't looking at it after it's after it's been on. Whereas a, a, the permanency of a book is terrifying. Isn't there uh, always a copy in the British Library as well, if you actually get a 
proper <laughs> published book. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's an insane thing to have got to do, and I mean, and also personally, it came at a very good time because uh, um, we just finished filming series three of Go Eight Bit, so I was able to um, give myself fully to that sort of a new project while I tried to get the ball rolling on the next thing. Um, so it, it it came at the right time, but uh, I wish I just wrote a load of stupid jokes about games. It was so much easier. <laughs> so much easier. Top a hundred. Yeah game related jokes yeah that <laughs> you know what i mean oh uh, christ it's I, I nearly killed me it was horrific but i but i'm glad i did it and i'm glad i worked that hard on it because it, it is generally now a book that uh you know pe- people i trust have uh, liked it and uh I, I think um yeah i think i made i think i've made a good thing i, I you know, i'm fundamentally just a nerd who really likes games and i'm re- i really hope i've made a book that other people like me will enjoy because I've, I've put everything into that book well, the book's called Hey Listen. I'm um, going to be out on the 18th of April. Yeah. So um, if people do want to get hold of it, and uh, I'm sure Paperback, it's going to be great. Kindle and audio book read by me. If you're not sick of my voice yet, you can have another 12 hours of that. Oh, I, I did an audio book a couple of months ago. That's hard work in itself, yeah. isn't it? That's tedious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just locked in a slowly heating cupboard yeah. for three days. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I enjoyed fun. it, but yeah, it's hard. You have to concentrate on saying things for ages. You ain't got to say them properly. It's, uh... Yeah, I'm going to pick you up on it if you don't. And again, and again, and again. I'm just waiting for the bit where Dan fell off his chair to see if that made the edit. <laughs> <laughs> After I've listened back our... to the 15 hours. <laughs> yeah, oh, we did that uh, because Dara couldn't record the forward so because um, he, he was uh, out of the country. So we, I got Sam in to record it instead, um, which was really, really nice. And he, there, there was a bit of mischief on the one that I think has gone in the audiobook. But we did also record a 15-minute um, long version of the forward where me and Sam just essentially character assassinate Dara for 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm trying to convince the publisher to let us put that out as like a teaser thing. Cause that, so you're talking about out takes that's the one I, I hope you'll all get to hear that because uh it was brutal <laughs> fantastic well steve i'll put a link in our show notes you know to where people can buy the book and uh, your podcast and everything as well oh thank um, you man it's been a pleasure having you on thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you for putting up with me just talking about myself for so long I'm like a massive egomaniac it was a pleasure really enjoyed it cheers Please.